Thanks everyone for tuning in again to Saints and Society. I know it's been a while since we've put out our last recording, so we're excited to be diving back in today. And today we're going to be talking about a Christian sex ethic. And so I'm excited to talk about this with the co-host here, Brad. Brad and I are excited to dive into this topic today and hope that it's beneficial for you guys as saints living in society to help shape your understanding in regard to Christian sex ethic. You're listening to Saints in Society, where we aim to equip saints to live in and engage with their society. We pray that through discussion and reading the word, we can engage culture in its terms, but not on them. The gospel speaks to all of life and provides all the answers we seek. So let's apply the gospel to our lives, living as saints in society. All right, Rick, here's the the opening question. Right now, uh, we are recording a podcast while my house currently doesn't have power. Eugene Springfield, where we live, has been hit with uh, our once annual snow slash ice storm, Mm -hmm. and it's a bit apocalyptic. In our neighborhood and most of Springfield, ice causes the tree branches to be so heavy that they break off and then just wreak havoc on power lines and everything. So uh, we haven't had power at our house since for a few days now. So my question, in light of all that, is what's a a current uh, or like a a, a technology or something that you either take for granted or couldn't live without that that's uh, (laughs) power-based. Yeah. Real quick. (laughs) I don't know if this annoys you or not, but this annoys me when people that aren't from around here live in different places that get a lot of snow and they're like, uh, what's with you guys or whatever. Like you you just can't handle a little snowstorm or something like that. I'm like, we don't have snowstorms. We have ice storms to where it's like, for whatever reason, you said this this morning. How come it doesn't snow? We no, just get just freezing, ra- freezing rain, rain. Yeah. that just freezes to all the limbs. And, and there's just there's like, there's like inches thick layers of ice on everything. Like yeah. our roads are inches thick of just solid ice. Our cars and trucks are coated in ice. Like it's not it's not snow. Yeah. And you, you were mentioning this uh, because this happens maybe once a year and is so rare. Our city <laughs> is just not like prepared. Like we don't have trucks that are dumping sand or de-icer or anything on slick roads. I don't even know if there's a snow plow in the area. Yeah. <laughs> like we, uh, the, the like city's infrastructure is just not set up for harsh winter conditions. And so when something like this happens, it shuts everything yeah. down. Yeah. Snow would be yeah. awesome. It's snow fluffy. Would be great. It's light. Yeah. Move it around. Make yeah. a snowman. No, this like, is just solid ice. Solid ice. And yeah. then in a couple of days, it's going to melt and be an absolute mess. Yep. But anyway, what, what I think that I couldn't live without would be a microwave Ooh, just for like the easy convenience of day-to-day stuff. Like, Hey, just, just nuke it real quick, throw it in the microwave, whatever it is, your coffee gets cold, just reheat it. It's like, Oh, yeah. do you want to reheat it? You got to put it in a pan, put it on the oven. Well, in your case, you better hope you <laughs> Build have a, a fire. <laughs> yeah. You, you fire up the jet boil or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I would just say a microwave would, would be one of the luxuries that I would hate yeah. living without. Also, I like TV and I like watching TV shows and movies and stuff like that. And so I would just say that yeah. I, would, I would miss that. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's funny you said that. That's what I was thinking too. I think you know you can we can deal with no lights. You just light candles and go to bed. Not having a TV, at least for our family, is not a big deal. We don't watch a ton of TV. Uh, but cooking, like cooking for a family of four without an oven or a stove that works or a microwave or hot water. Yeah. Like we were, I was out on the back deck cooking all of our meals on like our Blackstone griddle in 20 something degree weather, just freezing out there and you're like trying to cook for kids. And yeah, so not having the, the electronically powered cooking, uh, (laughs) (laughs) cooking gadgets, like just listen to third world. We sound, it's like, I had to go to my back deck <laughs> next to my brick oven pizza thing that I use. Fire up my propane fire, powered griddle. Fire up my blackstone griddle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jenna had a roast in the instant pot when the power went out. Mm. And so even like the instant pot and like a kettle to boil water, we got the jet boil out and we were making coffee that way because yeah, we have no, didn't have any way to heat water up. So yeah, th- those kinds of luxuries when you have them, you take them for granted. And then when you don't have them, it's like, yeah, yeah I guess we're eating cereal, I don't, you know, Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So there we go. Hopefully you are warm and safe wherever you are. We are going to do a podcast today on a topic that I think it's fair to say I maybe got a little pushback on at first. Uh, we're going to do a topic that... Are you referring to me pushing back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This might seem basic or 
like Christianity 101 or elementary or however you want to say it. This might seem obvious, I guess, to some listeners, but what we have we, we are finding as pastors is that this is not as obvious as maybe it once was in the church. And what we're talking about is the Christian sexual ethic. So we've done a couple podcasts on sex, and those were specifically from the approach of married couples and the the difficulties of sex inside of the context of marriage. What we want to talk about today is where do we get or what is the Christian sex ethic? What does the Bible say about sex, how it should be engaged, how it shouldn't be engaged. Is this the kind of thing where eh, culture, like the Bible was written a long time ago, and so we don't really have clear things on it, and so we can kind of go with the culture on what it says about sex, or are there clear, hard and fast lines and rules, black and white, in Scripture that give us instruction for how we are to think about sex uh, as followers of Jesus? And so that's what today's episode is about, the, the Christian sex ethic. The goal is to lay it out very clearly, to point to a lot of Scripture, uh, to show some of the, the implications of breaking that and, and engaging in sexual activity outside of what, what the Bible lines out, and then handle maybe some pushback or common pushback that we hear as pastors, um, and then, of course, apply apply the gospel to this, this, uh, this topic. So do you have any introductory remarks before we jump in? No, no. I think you've laid it out really well for where we're going. I retract my pushback. <laughs> and, and and it's not that I didn't think it's an important subject. Mm-hmm. It's just that after you laid it out, I agree with you. I think it's really important for us to cover. And so, yes. Yeah. Let's start here. Define a Christian sex ethic. Sure. According to the Bible, according to God's word, which we believe is true, without error, and authoritative, meaning it, it holds ultimate authority over life as the the word of God, we believe that sex is a good gift that is given to humanity by God for the purpose of reproduction and pleasure within the covenant of marriage. So key points there, it is a gift, it is good. We don't want to take the approach of, I think this happened, this was maybe a little more your time than my time, but like purity culture, where I think a lot of people who grew up in the church grew up with a a view of sex as sex is bad, sex is evil, Mm -hmm. sex is something to be avoided and run from at all costs. And then that caused all kinds of problems because no one ever talked about it within the church. So we don't want to go that far and say that sex is bad. We're saying sex is good. It's good. And it's a gift from God that he gives to us graciously. Uh, It has a purpose, purpose of reproduction, and then also pleasure and enjoyment within marriage. And then that's the, the last piece of that kind of definition is that there are, there are boundaries, there are limits to this gift God has given us and those boundaries and that limit is the covenant of marriage. Yeah. What would you like, do you think there's a lot of people that would disagree with that definition? Or do you think there's a lot of people that say that sex is purely transactional or something like that? Like, 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 why is this relevant? Uh, I think it's relevant because we live in a culture that would disagree. Well, they wouldn't disagree that sex is good. I think they would go a step further and say sex is not only good, sex is God in a lot of cases. To be human in our day and age is to be sexual. Like our our human identity is our, our sexuality. We see that in conversations about transgenderism and homosexuality. Uh, the I'll, I'll use a word that maybe is a little more confusing, but kind of the liberal approach, not political, just the liberal approach to sex and sexuality with open relationships and one night stands and hookup culture and uh, pornography and the the hypersexualization of our culture in a way that sex has no moral pros or cons. It's it's like an amoral act in some cases. It's just neutral. It's just neutral. Now, when you get into uh, the, the contradictions are, it's like neutral in most cases until there's a lack of consent or something like that. And then we get into moral statements being made about sex. But so, so we live in a, a culture that hyper, that's hypersexual, that promotes it as a good thing in any way that you want, as long as you're comfortable with it and you consent to it, sex is go for it. And there's, there's no, there's no deeper implications or ramifications of it outside of physical pleasure. And it's something we all do. So, so it's purely physical, purely physical. So that, that's one side of it. I think it's, this is important conversation then for the church, because I think that view of sex has seeped into the church in a lot of ways. I think we largely Christians are biblically illiterate. And so they're not familiar with their Bible um, and what it might have to say about these things. And then I also think that we live in a a post-Christian society where most people you run into are not starting with a 
kind of rudimentary Christian worldview, at, like maybe in generations past. And we've talked about this on the podcast before that, you know, 20, maybe 30 years ago, the people you run to have some kind of general understanding of Christianity and Christian ethics and morals. Now it's like we're so far removed from that, that most people, I don't know, this may be too strong of a statement, but a lot of people who are coming into the church to follow Jesus and are being being saved, they, they come in with a very different foundational understanding mm-hmm. of what the Bible has to say about these things, about the the morality mm-hmm. around sex. Um, so I think I think we have a lot of confused people who let the culture influence them too much, and then don't know what the Bible has to say about it, and so then they're going to be swayed and shaped by what they are used to, which is culture. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. You can shut this question down because I want to go back to where you would support from the biblical text yep. that sex is for pleasure and for reproduction. Is this being caught or taught? So when you say that Christians are bringing this in and people that are brand new to Christianity, let's say a baby Christian, mm-hmm. are they bringing this in because it's just been caught through their surroundings? Is it something that's being explicitly taught that sex is purely physical? Like, like where mm-hmm. is it coming from that it seems like it has such a strong, pervasive influence on our culture. Yeah. I think both. I think probably largely caught. Uh, it's like the, I think we've used this illustration before. It's like asking a fish how the water is, you know, it's what they're swimming in. I think in a lot of ways, the culture that we're swimming in, at least in the West in, but I think in most parts of the world, the culture we're swimming in is a, a sexualized kind of irreverent view of sex. And that's so, so a lot of that is caught, but then there's also, <clears throat> I think messages communicated through media, through, movies, TV shows, literature, and probably even in classrooms. And we won't get into that because that's a whole nother <laughs> uh, can of worms. But um, this, yeah, freedom to be attracted to or sexually attracted to whoever you want and to pursue and engage those attractions and explore those attractions. Like, I think there's there's an element that's being taught as well. Um, and we might not see the full ramifications of that for like another generation down the road. But, um, but you think about the sexual revolution in the sixties and seventies and the way that that changed the perspective, the like culture's perspective on sex. And I think that that has over time, you just kind of catch that and that, that catches up to, to people. So yeah, a little bit bit of both, but largely caught. Okay. Yeah. I I feel like I could pull the puck away out of play right now because I would say in the classroom, it's being taught as almost just uh, merely biological. Sure. And so here's what happens and here's how it happens. And Mm -hmm. just to be safe, get a condom. There is no spiritual element to that. There is no emotional element. Yeah. So Well, and what you said earlier, it's like sex is purely physical. And if it's purely physical and there's no spiritual, emotional implications or effects from it, then you remove any kind of reverence for the act of sex. Yeah. Okay. So, so support biblically. Because we don't want to be two dudes that are just offering opinions. and Well, we might want that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just <laughs> we shouldn't be that. Yes. Yeah. The foundation that we stand upon is the word of God. How does the word of God explicitly show that sex is for reproduction, but mm-hmm. also for pleasure? Sure. The Christian sexual ethic starts to get shaped very early in scripture. So in Genesis 1, when God creates the everything, he creates humanity as the pinnacle of that creation. He creates them in his image. Um, they are unique among the creatures that he makes, and he he gives them a commission. And here in Genesis 1, 28, it says, And God blessed them, this is Adam and Eve, humanity, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. So part of the commission to humanity given by God is to rule the earth. We were mm-hmm. to be co-rulers with God over this good creation that he made and we're to do it by making more humans. Like part of the way we do that is through reproduction, be fruitful and multiply, make more humans to fill this earth with rulers who are made in the image of God. In Genesis two, we get kind of a more in-depth look at how this is going to happen. So at the very end of Genesis 2 and verse 24, God has just created Eve out of Adam. And he says this, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So here we have the marriage covenant defined as a, a man and a woman coming together, leaving their families, holding fast to to each other and becoming one 
flesh. And then we have this this note that they were both naked and not ashamed. So in marriage, there is this security, there is an intimacy, and there is a, a union, a unity mm-hmm. in becoming one that happens, as we see later in the New Testament, that happens through the act of sex. That when, when two people engage in sex, that's actually combining them as one person. It's uniting them as one flesh. So so from the be- very beginning of our Bible, we're getting the kind of the beginning stages of, of forming this sexual ethic. Now, right after that note, everything goes downhill. Adam and Eve re- rebel against God. They say, we can do this whole ruling thing on our own without you. And so we're going to start defining good and evil for ourselves. And then creation spins out of control due to humanity's rebellion. We call this the fall of mankind, uh, sin, Mm -hmm. um, rejection of God's authority, rejection of disobeying God's word. And all these crazy, horrible, bad things start happening, including in the context of relationships. And so there's conflict between Adam and Eve's relationship. They have kids and there's conflict between uh, Cain and Abel and this 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 murder happens, and then we start to see uh, the descendants of Cain, and he c- collects wives as property, and then we just start to see sexual brokenness mm-hmm. happen because of sin. So then, as God introduces his his law to the people of Israel to give guidelines for what it looks like to be his chosen covenant people, large chunks of this law are dedicated to uh, sexual ethics. How should God's people think about and engage in sex as as people who have been called out by him to be a light to the nations? Skipping a lot of biblical theology here, but we're trying to move quickly through this. So in Leviticus 18, Deuteronomy 22, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, Jeremiah 23, we get these prohibitions against sexual immorality. And that comes in all various forms, uh, all kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, The clearest and kind of most catch-all is in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, which is just uh, engaging in sex with someone who is not your Mm -hmm. spouse, who is not your wife. And, and so there's these these clear prohibitions against sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage, which yep. has already been established in Genesis 2. Then we get to wisdom literature in the Old Testament, and you have the this both this celebration of sex and something like the Song of Songs, where you have these a man and a woman who are betrothed to one another, and there is there's passion and there's love and there's this anticipation for the wedding night mm-hmm. and they're they're waiting and they're longing for one another and there's the wedding night and it's like this this celebration of love and intimacy in wisdom literature in the Bible okay yep. but then there's also in the wisdom literature there's harsh or like strong warnings against sexual immorality in mm-hmm. Proverbs um, we see all kinds of warnings against the adulterous woman and the 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 lusts of the flesh and that kind of thing so there's this Again, sex is a good gift that is to be celebrated in this proper context, but then it can also be very dangerous and damaging when engaged in outside of that context. Context, and so there's 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 strong warnings against veering away from 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 God's good design. We get to the New Testament, and uh, in Paul's instructions to the church, uh, there are more prohibitions against sexual morality. Um, I think. You know, 1 Corinthians 6, Hebrews 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, just some examples. I'll read 1 Corinthians 6 because I think it's a, a helpful and probably one of the most full, I guess, explanations of this. So 1 Corinthians 6, uh, let's see, we'll start, in, we'll start in verse 12. It's a longer passage, but I think this is important. There's a lot here. And we can't do a full Bible study here, but you'll get the idea. So Paul is saying a quote that he's heard from the Corinthians and says, All things are lawful, lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. So there was a sentiment among the Corinthians. This is where grammatical hermeneutics are important. Yeah. Look for quotation marks. Right. There's a, there's a sentiment among the the Corinthians. It's like, oh, if I'm saved by grace and I have freedom in Christ, then all things are lawful. And so I'm just going to do what I want to do. So Romans six, should I sin all the more that grace may abound? The Corinthians were saying, by all means, like mm-hmm. go for it. You know, mm-hmm. all things are lawful. So that was a sentiment. And he was, uh, he, he, Paul's responding to that. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach are food. God will destroy both one to the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know, verse 15 here, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. 
Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? Right? So Paul's talking about sex here. He's talking Mm -hmm. about sexual immorality. So we go back to Genesis 2 and the one flesh union of Adam and Eve in the marriage covenant. He's now saying, if you engage in sex with someone who's not your spouse, here's the example as a prostitute, you become one with her. That unity still happens because of the act of sex. For as it is written, and he goes back to Genesis, the two shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So we get some really like deep theological implications mm-hmm. here of, of, of sex, right? And, and Paul, is, he's, he's addressing the cultural influence. He's bringing in the foundation of marriage and sex from Genesis. And the conclusion is you, you're not your own. You're, you're bought with a price. You are members of one body with Christ. And therefore, you're, and your body is a temple. And so do not join that body. Do not join yourself together through sex with someone who is then not your spouse, mm-hmm. right? The two becoming one flesh is referring to marriage. So that's one example. But all throughout the New Testament, there are, are prohibitions against sexual immorality, the Greek word there is porneia in most cases, which people will do all kinds of hermeneutical gymnastics to try to make that mean something it doesn't mean, but it's an all-encompassing term for any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage that Paul uses there. Yeah. So so let me ask you this. Yep. As you just briefly walk through 1 Corinthians 6, so that shows two people becoming one physically. Mm-hmm. Can you explain how sex is more than two people coming together physically and where scripture would make that clear that there is more than two people coming together that is purely physical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that passage I just read kind of indicates that because it's talking about your, your members of Christ and it talks about you, you being like, you've been united in body to Christ, but you're united to him in spirit. And in the same context, it's talking about uniting yourself to prostitute. So there's some sort of spiritual uniting going on there as you become one with someone. So, so I think there's, there's that. I also think we know this, and we've talked about this in other podcasts. We know this from a biological standpoint. Our biology is only, is only affirming our, our theology that the act of sex has a, has a bonding result when two parties come together mm-hmm. and do that. So we've ta- again, we've talked about this before, but for a refresher, when you engage in sex, the, uh, the chemical oxytocin is released, which is a, a bonding hormone, a bonding chemical. Mm-hmm. It's the same chemical that's released when a mother is breastfeeding her, her child. And so the, the bonding that takes place between mother and, and child during the act of breastfeeding, that, that's not a physical bonding, right? That's an emotional, uh, you could even argue a spiritual bonding. It's a bit t- of a physical bonding. Well, it is. <laughs> that's not just a physical <laughs> bonding. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, um, but there's a, uh, there, there's a deep <laughs> bonding going on there between mother and child. <laughs> um, that same kind of chemical bonding is taking place in sex. That's why people say, Wives love their kids more than their husbands and husbands love their wives more than their kids Yeah, because the wives have that bond with their children and then husbands have the sexual bond yep. with their wives. So, so I think theologically we can see that there is a spiritual union taking place as we're joining as one with someone through the act of sex. And then bio- biology only affirms that there is a, a, a uniting and uni- like a bonding going yeah. on. And here's God the thing. also created us with the soul. Yeah. Like we are not just pure. Totally. Physical. Absolutely. And those things are not separate. It's yeah. not like we do stuff with our physical and then the souls over here, not, not participating in that yeah. thing we're doing. They're intermingled and, and joined together. And, you know, people might push back against this, but honestly, and this is anecdotal. And so there's going to be outliers out there, but people who have, who have engaged in sexual activity with someone whether spouse or not, I th- I believe knows there, there's like a bonding that takes place there. there there's a, a, a meshing and uh, molding together. Like your, your relationship with that person will never be the same because you've shared in that bonding intimacy together. Totally. Yeah. And so I think, I think if people are honest, they would be like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Once yeah. you've, once you've crossed that line with someone spouse or not, there's something now unique and different about yep. that relationship. So um, well, let me ask this to keep us going. Okay. 
someone comes to you and says, okay, great. So there's a Christian sex, sex ethic. And the Bible tells us that it just seems like, uh, there's a lot of parameters here that Mm -hmm. suck the joy out of sex. And so, yeah. How would you respond to that? It, 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 it it just seems like these parameters are this tight little box Mm -hmm. and yeah, I would say we're missing out. I would say we need limitations. Okay. We need boundaries. I've used this before in a sermon, you know, a, a fish is limited to water and yet it is within those limitations that a fish thrives. You could say a fish is restricted and limited and boxed in because of these these boundaries that prevent freedom, or you could say that it's those very things that actually create an environment for the fish to thrive in. So a helpful illustration that I, is, I think it's helpful for me is we can think about sex like fire. Um, I believe there's a Kings of Leon song that is something like your sex is on fire. Or, yeah, yeah, there is. Okay. Yep. So, uh, you're, so think of sex like a fire. Fire in and of itself, has a, a, a tremendous amount of power to provide life. So we're, our house is out of power. For the first night where we were home, I we have a, a wood stove in our house. That was our only source of heat. <clears throat> and so without that, we would have been very, very cold. And so, so fire provides life. It provides warmth. Um, it, it, it provides sustenance. That There's a, there's a, a tremendous apou- amount of life-giving power mm-hmm. in fire. We also, this last summer, uh, in the Springfield area, had a massive wildfire that destroyed, what was it, tens of thousands of acres mm-hmm. of, of the forest not too far from Springfield. And so fire has this tremendous life-giving power, but it's also very damaging and destructive. The difference between the fire that kept our family warm and the fire that destroyed tens of thousands of acres was the fire that kept us warm had limitations around it, right? Yeah. It was it was within- Like a small box. Like a small box, yeah. <laughs> so in the same way that fire is a good thing when kept within, for example, a stove or a fireplace mm-hmm. or some sort of limitations, its power can be harnessed in a safe, um, life-giving way. Outside of those boundaries, outside of those limitations, left to run wild, it's incredibly damaging and destructive. And so I would say that sex in a similar or in the same way, within the safety, the safe confines, boundaries and limitations of marriage, sex actually thrives and brings life and goodness and flourishing where God intended it to be. When it is broken out of that boundary and engaged in outside of the context of marriage, then it creates a lot of damage, destruction and death. And uh, again, I think anecdotally, if people are honest, they can admit that that's maybe true. Yeah. I I think that's a helpful analogy. Yeah. So the fire inside of your house was kept inside of a stove, which provided heat and life for your Mm -hmm. guys' family. If the fire came out of the stove into your house, it would have burned your house down. Okay. So that makes sense as far as the parameters go. Are the, what are the parameters for sex that the Bible lays out? Marriage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's where I want to be. So I'll say that and then caveat, right? Okay. Because I think I know where you're going. I'll be really clear, as clear as possible here. Any sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage, so that's adultery, sex with a boyfriend, girlfriend, or fiance, we would say that's homosexuality, is sinful and not part of God's design for sex. Now, I'm going to take that a step further because Jesus takes it a step further. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to lust and he says, you've heard it said, She'll not commit adultery, but, so there's like, wait a minute, there's more. I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus takes our sinful activity that's external Mm -hmm. and says, no, this is actually a heart problem. It's internal. And so not only would the Christian sex ethic say that sexual activity outside of marriage is sinful, but now we have a heart thing here, according to Jesus, where the the, the gaze of our eyes, the intentions of our hearts, the thoughts in our mind are sinful as well when we're lusting after someone who is not our spouse. And so it's not just activity, but also um, also our, our heart and our thoughts mm-hmm. uh, towards someone else. So that then includes in what we would say, I keep saying what we would say, I should be saying what the Bible says, yeah. um, what the Bible would refer to as sin is not just sexual activity, but also things like pornography and it's wide variety of forms, right? Uh, strip clubs, uh, anytime, anytime you are looking at someone and undressing them in your mind, or you def- using them to gratify your sexual desires in your mind as you fantasize, Jesus would say that's sin. Mm-hmm. And that's what these laws about sexual morality are actually getting at yeah. is are we viewing other people 
as humans to be loved, not objects to be used for mm. our own personal gratification. Yeah, dang. So that's helpful. Okay. So sex inside of a marriage. Mm-hmm. What do you do with the young man or woman that comes to you and they're always trying to find the gray area and they say, what about dry humping? What about oral sex? What about all of those things? Can me and my boyfriend and girlfriend do those things? I, I, would, I, would, I would go back to Jesus's words. Yeah. It's not about the physical actions. On one hand it is, but those physical actions are driven by a condition of your heart. Mm-hmm. And those particular acts that you just, that you just explained are... Uh, self-gratifying, yeah. right? It's like, I- I'm going to do this for my own pleasure, which is, I think, a, a comes from a, a lustful heart, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm going to use you in some way. I'm going to use your body in some way to give me pleasure. Yeah. And so the the heart underneath that is still, I believe, disobedient to Jesus's clear commands on, yeah. on sexual morality. So yeah. I, I don't think there's loopholes to get around it when you're addressing the heart. And if someone's like, well, you know, I really love this person and, you know, we serve each other or, you know, it's like, great, get married. Yeah. Get married. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, We'll, we'll get to this later, but it's like, you're, you're still experiencing the benefit. question. How do I glorify God in this relationship that I'm in? Yeah. And so can I glorify God by doing this? Can I glorify God by doing this? Mm -hmm. And so instead of asking the question, Hey, how far can I go? Why not ask the question? Hey, how do I glorify and honor God in this relationship with this man or this woman Mm -hmm. in such a way that brings glory to him is I think a better question than how close can I get to sin without actually sinning? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask this then. Mm -hmm. Good job addressing the heart. So how does because we were just talking about this, how does a covenant then provide better grounds for sex? Or yeah. I don't even know if that's the best way to phrase it, but why why is a covenant the best place for sex to be, I don't know. Done. Done, <laughs> carried out. <laughs> yeah, engaged in. <laughs> engaged in, yeah. Um, uh, because a covenant provides relational security. Now, this is where it gets really tough because in our world, You can go and get a divorce for literally no reason at all. Mm -hmm. But according to the Bible, marriages are not meant to stop. Marriages are not meant to separate due to divorce. So a covenant, according to the Bible, is a relational commitment where each party agrees to unconditionally love and pursue one another until death. Unconditionally, right? And so whatever is going on on the other side of this, that does not mean you don't stop pursuing that person. So in that, in those parameters, in the safety of a, a covenant relationship where the other person's not going anywhere, sex can be engaged in. Because then that bonding that takes place during sex, that's a beautiful thing. That's part of God's design for sex is that bonding that takes place. And you can bond yourself to another person as one if that's the person you're going to be one with for the rest of your life. That's good. So, so explain how... The common statement that is said, well, you need to test drive the car before you buy it mm-hmm. is actually very conditional and awful and evil and horrendous and whatever else <laughs> I want to throw in there to say. Yeah. Um, Explain that. We'll flip it back. Okay. Yeah. So what if uh, I was interested in marrying a woman, but I said, ah, before we get married, I need you to cook me three meals a day. I want to see how good of a cook you are. Uh, I want a back rub. I want to see how strong your hands are and mm-hmm. see what kind of massages I'm going to get. Yep. Um, do you have any debt? What's your credit score? Um, man, what's your extended family drama like? I don't really want to be in a relationship where there's too much of that, right? You can see. And while we're looking at your extended family's drama, do you mind showing uh, proof of medical records? Because yeah, I want to yeah. know what the odds are of you getting sick and yeah. you know, me having I, I to I want to know what you. kind of genetic disorder, disorders my kids might have due yeah. to your family lineage and all yeah. that kind of stuff. I mean, that's sick, right? Yeah. You're, you're going down this list of conditions and qualifications that if you meet them, then mm-hmm. I'll love you. Then I will commit myself to you. And so to say the same thing in sex is is no different. It's like, man, if you perform well in the bedroom, if you satisfy me in the way that I want to be satisfied, if you, if you do X, Y, Z during sex, 
then then I can I can commit to that kind of sex for the rest of my life. But if it's not up to my taste or to my liking or if it doesn't do it for me or whatever it might be, then I don't want to commit to that to the rest of my life. So it's a it's a conditional commitment, which is the antithesis of what marriage is, an unconditional commitment. So anytime, yeah, it's like you want to test things out. And and on one hand, that's what dating is, right? Is you're like, do I like this person? You know, are, are we and somewhat on the same page in our mission in life, you know, like, so I'm not going to, I'm not saying you just pick someone and say, let's do this. Maybe that should be a a future podcast that we should get rid of dating and uh, just do arranged marriages. Marriages are statistically more successful than not arranged marriages. Yeah. Wonder why that is. I think it's because they have a better definition of marriage, but anyway, another podcast. So yeah, it's, it's, you're starting to bring conditions into, I will commit to you if you do this for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really selfish. Okay. Um, and, and if you get into marriage with someone who is like that, then prepare for them to leave when you don't meet their expectations. Like if you went into a marriage testing one another to see if this is going to work, if I'm going to conditionally love you, then someday you're going to let them down. You're not going to meet the expectations. And mm-hmm. if you already established a marriage on the basis of conditions, then when those conditions aren't met, the chances of things not working out are, I think, much higher. Yep, in totally. most cases. So, um, one of the other things that, that you've talked about, and I think this will keep us moving along is that Christians should be set apart. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if you use the language set apart, but when I think about Christians, we are called saints, mm-hmm. which means that we're called to be holy, which means that we're called to be set apart. Yeah. And so Christians should have a biblical sex ethic, yeah. but we should be set apart. Tell me how you think it will damage the church mm-hmm. and it'll damage our Christian evangelism if we have a faulty sex ethic or if we aren't set apart in this area yeah well yeah if the if the if we're to be in the world and not of it if we are to be set apart like you're saying this word holy that's like set apart from the world around us that's not to shove our holiness in the world's face and say look how much better we are than you that's to say look at how much better life with christ is than life without like our 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 holy living is to be attractional to the non-believer to be like man there's something different there what's that all about mm-hmm. how do i how do i live like that um there's this really good article and i i've heard this in a lot of different um from a lot of different sources here's an article that tim keller wrote uh in response to some research that someone had done about uh basically what's what what made the early church unique so After Jesus ascends into heaven, he commissions the apostles to go preach the gospel and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we see the church spring up from that in Jerusalem, Judea, the ends of the earth, right? And right away, those early churches are being struck by persecution. It is not popular to be a Christian. And yet these churches grow. So the the kind of point of this article and the research that he's responding to is like, how did the church grow if it was not popular and to be a Christian meant to be persecuted. And he talks about it as it's, it's like this new social project. Christians are given a new identity as individuals. I'm in Christ, but I'm also given a new identity as a community as part of the church. And this new community is a representation of Christ's kingdom here on earth. And that kingdom is visible. It's, you can see it, you can touch it, you can experience it. And this this new kingdom that exists within earthly kingdoms looks very different than the world around it. And so he, he points out five things that the early church in the midst of persecution, uh, that five things that made it very different and attractive to the world around it. So the first thing is that the early church was multiracial, experienced a unity across ethnic boundaries that was startling. Whole nother podcast there. Mm-hmm. Number two, the early church was a community of forgiveness and reconciliation. So what other community do you forgive and reconcile even when it costs you and it hurts a yeah. lot? Number three, the early church was famous for its hospitality to the poor and the suffering. So Christians were incredibly hospitable people. Number four, it was a community uh, committed to the sanctity of life. People valued life. And so you see them valuing people who uh, the Roman world would have seen as less valuable. So mm-hmm. women, slaves, children. And then number five, it was a sexual counterculture. And so there was something about the Christian sex ethic in the early church that was attractive to a Roman culture that was sexually promiscuous, much in the same way that our culture is today. It just looked more ancient. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so being, being against the grain and countercultural and something that is so valuable and so reverent and so, 
has so much kind of power and poignancy around it can be very attractive to the world. And so if, if, if Christians adopt a sexual ethic that's no different than the world's, we're going to lose, I think, some credibility to our witness to the world when we say, hey, come check this out. Life is so much better and different. And they say, well, it's not that different because you're not. And you can say this for anything, right? Not mm-hmm. just sex, but um, how we spend our money. Right, what we do with our time, how we raise our kids, like like there's a lot of things in the Christian's life that, well, in fact, everything should be set apart from mm-hmm. the world, right? Um, but since we're talking about sex here, our, the sexual ethic that we adopt um, as Christians and then show that to the world, I think people, I think the world looks at that and goes, man, that's different. That seems restrictive. That seems like you're li- limiting your freedom and your pleasure and your fun. And that's and then eventually it's like actually that seems like a way better way of life. Yeah. Your marriages are actually thriving. Mm-hmm. You're, you actually have a better sex life than we do with multiple partners. You know, there's more joy. There's more, you know, so I, I, you know, children are a blessing and a good thing. So I think, I think that sexual counterculture is attractive to the world and helps support our witness when we preach the gospel and tell people that there is abundant life available in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Th- this is a, uh... Before I was pastoring here at Gospel Community Church, I was pastoring at another church and I had to let my intern go. And the reason why I let him go is because he was, and, and I want to protect sure. an information here, but uh, he was having sex outside of marriage. Mm-hmm. And, and this was not like a one-time thing. This was a multiple thing. And one of the questions I asked him is I said, hey, how are you treating these women any different from other men in their life? that aren't Christians. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, it was almost like there was a moment for him to be hit by that. And so like the meeting and ended with both of us because I I walked him through, which is where I want us to wrap up today is how does the gospel speak to all of us? Uh, Because we don't want people walking away with feeling shame or guilt. Mm -mm. I do also want to get to how the gospel calls us to repentance as well. But uh, he was crying. I was crying. And and, and it was like, it, it was almost like something hit him of like, how am I modeling that I love, cherish, and respect women in a way that sets me apart from other women, uh, fr- fr- from other men. Or yeah. am I just like every other man that comes into these women's lives, mm-hmm. gets my fix, and then moves on and stuff? And so, yeah, I, I think that is another example of hey. Then they look at that and go, "Wow, you are a Christian man. You've treated me just like every other man who doesn't claim to be a Christian." Right. That hurts a witness. Totally. So yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So so, so uh, speak to all this, or show how the gospel speaks to all of this. Yeah how the gospel uh, saves us, how the gospel heals us, and how the gospel transforms us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me start by saying this. We do not approach this topic as people who think we have a moral high ground or are morally superior or as, as people who don't struggle with sexual sin. You and I are both sexual sinners. My story and how pornography has been a part of that is on a podcast from a couple of years ago. You can go ahead and listen to that. So we do not approach this as people who are somehow morally superior and everyone needs to get on our level. We or come, have arrived. Or have arrived. Yeah. We come at this as, as men who are sexually broken and the effects of our sexual brokenness and sin still impact our relationships yeah. and marriage and our, our, our souls in, in some ways. So that's how we arrive at a conversation like this. The Bible is still clear on what is right and wrong and good and evil. And so we want to be loud and and, and uh, clear proponents of that mm-hmm. while also showing that there is, there's grace, there's forgiveness, there is hope. There's hope and healing for the sexual sinner and sufferer. And so the Bible is ripe with stories of sexual sinners who receive the grace of mm-hmm. God. Rahab, David, uh, Solomon. Tamar. Tamar, yeah, yeah. Uh, What's the dude's name who killed a bunch of people with a jawbone? Sanson. Um, I couldn't remember. It was one of those yeah. S's. So here, here's a story that I think I think really captures and helps um, kind of kind of speak the gospel into this. This is John chapter eight, and Jesus arrives at this scene. Uh, it says, "Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple. All the people came to him. He sat down and taught them. Scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. And they said to him, "Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses." commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And they're saying this to test him. So just think about the scene here. Jesus is teaching. He's at the Mount of Olives. And it says that this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this woman was likely pulled from bed, naked or partially clothed, drug into a square where there's a bunch of people and thrown at the feet of Jesus. And like the law says to stone her. So so imagine the shame, the, the guilt, feeling dirty, exposed, Trying to put yourself in the shoes of that woman, 
you're probably getting close to what most sexual sinners and sufferers experience and feel Mm -hmm. like when confronted with our sexual sin is dirty, unwanted, exposed, ashamed. Okay. See how Jesus responds to this. They said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against them. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Okay. So scholars go back and forth on what Jesus was writing. And Mm -hmm. honestly, we don't know. Here's what I like to say. And it could be right. It could be wrong. I think Jesus is drawing the crowd's attention away from the woman. Mm -hmm. I think, I think rabbi getting down in the ground and like writing and drawing in the dirt, everyone's like, what is he doing? And all of a sudden this woman who's all eyes are on in her shame, no one's looking at her Mm -hmm. right or wrong. I don't know. The text doesn't say, but I think Jesus would do something like that. Uh, I think he would protect her in her shame. And then of course the famous, whoever doesn't have sin, throw a stone at her Mm -hmm. and they all walk away because foundationally, what we have to understand is we're all sinners. Uh, we have all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And so no one is morally superior than anyone else. No one is good, not one. Everyone leaves. Jesus is left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. That's Jesus's response to someone caught in sexual sin. Not condemnation, not more shame or ridicule, not throwing stones, but grace and mercy and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Have you heard the story? I think Matt Chandler says tells it where he's at a conference. Yeah. Are you talking about the rose? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's actually the time that Matt Chandler realized that he wanted to be a preacher and preach the gospel. Oh, really? I yeah. didn't know that part of it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Matt Chandler is at this conference and a guy starts his talk on purity. sex and purity yeah. and he hands a rose to someone in the front row and he's like, pass that around. And then by the time he's done with his talk on purity, the rose makes its way back up onto the stage and it's all wilted and broken and like looks all tattered and disgusting. I think what he asked him to do too was like pluck oh, the really? petals. Yeah. Out, so, so, so by the, by the time it got back to him, you know, multiple hands had been on it. It was, it did not look like a beautiful rose. And the guy, the speaker holds it up and says, see this, who would want this? And the, the, the implication of the illustration was if you go sleep with a bunch of people, then at the end of the day, who's going to want you? And Matt Chandler says it took everything within him to not stand up and scream out from the crowd. Jesus wants you. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's what I don't want the response of the church or Christians to be to people who are struggling with sexual sin or in sexual sin to be like, no one wants you, but rather Jesus wants you. Mm -hmm. Jesus paid for your sexual sin on the cross. Jesus became a battered, tattered, torn apart rose on the cross so that you could maintain your purity and beauty as a rose. He endured the consequences of our sin, including our sexual sin on the cross. And so if you come to Jesus, there is forgiveness, there is reconciliation, there's hope, there's healing, there's mercy and grace for the sexual sinner. But notice what Jesus says after neither do I condemn you. He says, go. Mm -hmm. And from now on, sin no more. Yeah. So the lack of the, the, I don't condemn you, the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, the salvation comes first, but then after that is go and sin no more. So he doesn't, he doesn't shy away from the fact that she was sinning. He acknowledges that that was sin. I've saved you from it. No one's going to condemn you. Now go live a life of purity. Yeah. Go live a life, not continuing to engage in this act. And so that would be my call to, if you're a Christian listening to this and you are currently in the act of sexual sin, currently sinning sexually, Jesus doesn't condemn you. You are free in Christ. You're pure. There's grace, mercy, forgiveness, abundant. You will never out sin the grace of God. Now go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. Go walk in that purity. Walk in that righteousness that's been purchased for you by Christ on the cross. You're going to experience more joy by doing that. You are. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever the world tells you, whatever your desires, the desires of the flesh tell you, that path is a dangerous and damaging one that is going to bring hurt to both you and the people around you, to the church, to the witness of the gospel, and to the people you're engaging in this act in. Great. Uh, pastorally, closing th- thoughts, anything that you'd want to say? Yeah, I think, I think. well, my pastoral thoughts to the person engaged in sexual sin is what I just said. Foot of the cross, come to Jesus. You've been forgiven. Now go and sin no more. Maybe some thoughts to people who are in relationship with people in in sexual sin and they're like, haven't said anything or don't know how to say something. I would really encourage you to say something Um, because if you don't, I don't think anyone else will. They're not Mm -hmm. going to get truth from any other source in their life. And so to 
uh, to have a conversation with someone about sexual sin and to be bold in that. I think we're called to do that in scripture, but to do so graciously, lovingly, Mm -hmm. and and in a way that points them back to the gospel, I think is really important. I think, you know, part of the, so first Corinthians five talks about this sexual sin that was going on in the church and Paul addresses the sin, but he also addresses, he's like, and you all approved of this. Mm -hmm. Like none of you said anything. Like that's part of Paul's, uh, Paul, part of his exhortation to the Corinthian church is not just to this one man who was engaged in sexual sin, but also to the church for allowing it to go on without saying anything. A, a really cool story of how that can be received is uh, Ronnie Gogan, one of our former elders, mm-hmm. and he, he's been on this podcast, said that many people in his church knew that he was living with his girlfriend, but only one one guy and kind of a bit of an awkward gentleman came up to him and told him that the way that he was living was sinful. And Ronnie said he was uh, offended and Mm -hmm. appalled. And and then, but after uh, Ronnie became a Christian, because he wasn't at that time, and and after he had a new heart, he struggled to trust the rest of the people that, because he was also like going to a small group and checking stuff out. He struggled to trust a lot of the people that were around him that were Christians because he said he struggled to know if he was living in such a way that was damning, why no one loved him enough to ever say anything to him. And then therefore he had so much trust for this guy, Mm -hmm. but not for all the other Christians around him, which I was like, whoa, that's, that's powerful. It is. If, if we really believe that God's word is authoritative and true and right. And if we believe that this is sin, then to, you know, steal the pen and teller thing. It's like, how much do you have to hate someone to not say something? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, I think as, as a community, we need to engage this lovingly, graciously, but firmly as well, Mm -hmm. because I think it's more prevalent in the church than people maybe realize or would like to admit, which is why we decided to do this podcast. Yeah. So, yeah. A couple of things that I would say pastorally. One is kind of to the rose thing. To any man or woman, you're not damaged goods. And what that can produce is since I'm damaged, I might as well keep living this way. The most pure and innocent and beautiful person to ever live and walk this earth transferred that beauty and that purity and that innocence to us through faith in him, which is Jesus Christ. And so we literally, his purity, his innocence, and his beauty belongs to us. God makes it ours. And so that's what we have. We we have a beauty that far surpasses any life that a virgin could have, a, any life that anyone, uh, you know, striving to obey all the rules could have. We mm-hmm. have Christ's uh, beauty. Also, I, I want our listeners to hear this. If you're someone who is single and if you're someone who's uh, that you've kind of given up on marriage or it, it, it's been really hard and, and you're like, man, so much is said about sex. I, I, w- I want to affirm this. You can have a meaningful, fulfilled life by never having sex in this life because the most joyful, fulfilled person to ever walk this earth was Jesus Christ and he never had sex. Mm -hmm. The apostle Paul would be another example. And so I don't want also people to hear like, man, I'm missing out on so much. I would say you can uh, miss out on sex, but still have incredibly close relationships and even intimacy that's involved in Christian community that you don't have to miss out on. Uh, And so, yeah, I want people to know that's not an area where like your life is not going to be fulfilled or complete. Yeah. Because you're single. And not only was Jesus the perfect, most fulfilled, joy-filled human, but he was tempted in every way that we are. Mm-hmm. And so the temptations that you experience as a single person yeah, good. in regards to sex and sexuality, Jesus experienced those same temptations. Just because Jesus never had sex doesn't mean he was ever tempted or never tempted with his, his thoughts or his, his, his actions. And so we have a high priest that can sympathize with us. And so, so yeah, run to, run to your great high priest who, who knows what it's like to be tempted in those ways. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, uh, hopefully this was helpful. Like we said at the beginning, this is maybe seems obvious, but I think this is something that needs to continually be addressed because of how much pressure there is from the world to conform to something that is not not biblical. And so that's our goal. Our hope is to lay out the clear biblical sexual ethic and then the implications for that and uh, provide yeah hope and healing through the gospel to those in these various situations. So thanks for listening. Uh, we're still, uh, this season's a little weird because we haven't recorded in a while, but we're still planning on doing a Q&A. So if you have any questions for uh, Rick or me, go ahead and put, the, you can send those to the email in the show notes. You can leave them in a review wherever you get your podcast. And at the end of this season, and whenever that is, maybe 2026 or something like that. Now it'll be sooner than that. We'll we'll address those questions and and do as many Q and A episodes as we need, I guess. So yeah, uh, go ahead and leave those questions. Thanks for listening to another episode in Saint Society. Mm-hmm.